Welcome to the Killer Boobies podcast, unraveling breast implant illness, sharing stories of women who went from victim to victor, interviewing doctors with their insight, and sharing hope and tools to reclaim health. Here's your hosts, Wendy Bunnell, Leslie Smoot, and Brandy Vega. And as always, we want to make sure you know that this podcast is not intended for the purpose of providing medical advice. All information, content, and material of this podcast is for informational purposes only. Welcome to the Killer Boobies podcast. I'm your host of the day. My name is Wendy Bunnell, and in my studio today is the beautiful Robin Tout. She lives in gorgeous Arizona, and we're all jealous probably at this time of the year that she gets to be there. And if you're in a mountainous region with lots of snow, um, like we are in Utah, we are absolutely envious. So thank you so much for being here, Robin, and spending the time with us today. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy, for having me. Absolutely. And so, Robin, you're a busy woman, like all of us are right now in America. You have children, you have um, advocacy work, you are someone who's out there trying to make a difference in this breast implant illness platform. Is that correct? It is correct. Yeah. I have two kiddos in college, so the timing for me um, has been really nice because it's kind of a, a shift from going from, you know, being mom to they're off on their own. And now this is kind of my new hobby. So, and there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of hours of work that, uh, that I've been putting in. So, but we're making a lot of progress too. I can only imagine because, you know, I, I see a lot of women when they go through this and they have to make so, some sort of sense out of what has happened to them, right? Like, and, and being able to pay it forward and becoming the, the person who pays it forward and that your mess now becomes your message, right? You are out there advocating yeah. and making sure that other women don't have to go through this or that they have um, less of, of a, you know, time lapse between trying to figure out what's going on and, and some Re, you know, an explant so that they can reclaim their health. You know, all of those things come into play and you can become an advocate and become a full-time advocate. And I, I would venture to guess you're probably in that category. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm all in. <laughs> yeah. And For you sure. know, which totally makes sense because you have a very unique story. Not only did you have breast implant illness, but you are also a survivor of breast cancer as well. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I was diagnosed in May of 2017 and I did reconstruction with tissue expanders. I had a bilateral mastectomy and I was early stage cancer. So for me doing a double mastectomy, um, it, was, it was mostly so I could avoid other treatments and just kind of get on with my life. Um, I wasn't interested really in reconstruction and dragging out the whole breast cancer experience. It was my third cancer. So just being a prior mm-hmm. cancer survivor, it was kind of like, I just wanted to get on with my life and on to the next thing. So the quicker I could do it, the better. Um, but I was kind of talked into reconstruction. Um, I definitely was not given proper informed consent. I definitely was not given the information that I was supposed to be given according to the FDA, um, you know, way back when they put silicone implants back on the market, uh, the FDA had pre-market approval agreements with the implant manufacturers. And one of the conditions of those agreements was that each patient get the patient information booklet Mm -hmm. for the implants that they were using. And I never got that from my surgeon. You're not alone, Robin. Do you know how many people do not get that? In fact, Leslie Smoot, one of the other hosts, she got that as Mm -hmm. she was being wheeled out of the surgery room. Well, thank you very wow. much. I sure appreciate yeah. it. Right? Yeah. I got mine uh, five months after I had my breast implants removed because I asked for it. So definitely there's a problem with that. I actually recently did a poll um, because I've been doing a lot of legislative work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I recently did a poll on some of the groups and over 4,000 women responded and 86% of women did not get that information. Mm. Um, so there's a big disconnect there. We, we need to fix that. So um, part of what I've been doing over the last two and a half years now is kind of got away from the support group end of it and decided to do some things about it. Um, 
we have actually in the state of Arizona, um, my colleagues and I just unanimously passed uh, the first informed consent breast implant illness bill, and it passed unanimously with no um, resistance in the state oh. Senate. So we're on to the House, and then the governor will sign it into law. So we're super excited about that. That is so exciting. So tell us what this bill will do. You say, you know, give us an idea of how this will change things. So basically, um, we kind of sat around and brainstormed everything that we wish we had when we got breast implants. So we, um, we actually created a checklist that is very easy to read and very easy to understand. And in that checklist, um, we include the black box warning recommendations from the FDA. And that part isn't final yet. The FDA is working on that, but they did do a draft guidance. Um, so we took some of the wording from that. We actually elaborated on that wording as well. Um, the unique thing about Arizona is we've been working with the Arizona Society of Plastic Surgeons for about a year and a half now. Mm -hmm. So we've been collaborating with them and they were, they took a big part in, in creating this checklist with us. It was a collaborative effort. Um, so it's pretty special and unique in that way. And honestly, I think when we, when we took it to the Senate floor to get voted on, there was no resistance because we worked on it together. Mm -hmm. um, I think at this point in the game, everyone knows there's a problem between ALCL, which you know is the lymphoma that's caused by breast implants, and then all these women that are getting sick with breast implant illness. Um, we need to do something. We need to take action. So I really applaud um, not only the Arizona Society of Plastic Surgery, but also the Arizona Medical Association for taking a really big step and being the pioneers in getting some of this legislation passed. Um, so basically what, that, what our law will outline is um, the, it will be mandatory for surgeons to not only give us the patient information booklet that's required by the FDA, mm -hmm. we will also be getting that checklist that goes over basically the things that breast implant illness women wish they knew. Mm -hmm. um, and when, I, when we were working on the wording with that, you know, a lot of girls, there's young girls that are getting breast implants. I mean, there's so many different groups. You know, you have the young girls that maybe saved up their high school graduation money, or they're just getting out of college, starting their career, and they want to, you know, they want their figure to match their big career. Um, or you have your, your moms that are done having kids and just want a little mommy makeover. Um, so the interesting thing that I started thinking about was, you know, I pictured like a 23 or 24 year old woman who is maybe getting ready to graduate college and wants to start her career in life and she's ready to get breast implants, some of the things that are in even the patient information booklet that if you were lucky enough to get one, um, some of the things that are in there are really difficult to understand. And I remember when I was 23, 24 years old, I didn't know what lupus was. I didn't know what fibromyalgia was. Um, in fact, when the doctors ask you, do you have any autoimmune disease history, I don't really think young people or people that don't have health issues really know what that means. I know exactly what you're saying. And quite honestly, Robin, I can sit here and say, oh, well, I was never given one of those pamphlets, but my husband and I got real one night and he said, now, sweetheart, honestly, honestly, if you would have gotten that booklet back when you got these, what would you have done? And I would have said, you know what? I had, I was so healthy up until that point. I would have said, oh mm -hmm. no, that work, that happens to someone else. And I'm certain that's what right. these young, these young, you know, teenagers, young adults that are looking towards breast implants are probably thinking as well. I've never experienced poor health. So I don't even know what that looks like. I don't know what that means. Right. And Absolutely. Um, being able to say it in their verbiage. In fact, one of the things that Killer Boobies wants to do is go onto TikTok, go onto the places where they are at and help them understand exactly. what it looks like. Is that what you want to do? Right. Yeah, you're going to look beautiful here. But what about your, what about the rashes and the acne and all of the other things that may happen? The bloodshot eyes, the dry yeah. eyes. What about your hair, hair coming out? Is that beautiful? Yeah. You know, speaking their language, saying, hey, you exactly. know what, you may not know what lupus and fibromyalgia is. And sisters, we do not want you to know what that feels like because I know what that feels like. And that is no right. fun. But speaking the language that, that they are speaking, well, okay, well, I'm beautiful here, but all those other things may happen. Maybe I don't want that. 
So I love exactly. that you guys are thinking about this. You're thinking about how does this verbiage, how does this message play to the ones that are really leaning more towards this, which is that, which is that younger group of women. And we need those women to be strong so that they can help shape and foster this wonderful country that we're living in years later, right? right. They can't do that if they're sick. They can't. Exactly. Right. Well, and I think too, it'll help women figure it out quicker when they do start getting sick. Um, and you would know from being on the group, you know, so many women have spent years and thousands and thousands of dollars chasing a diagnosis, what's wrong with me, seeing all different kinds of specialists. Um, if they knew this information up front, they probably could have figured it out years sooner, right? So, and, and you're absolutely right. Our, the women are still going to get the breast implants if they want them. And that's, what they feel is going to make them feel whole and complete, um, they're going to do it. And it's just they need to do it with the proper information. They need to be fully informed and aware. And then if and when problems do happen, they can put the links together and figure it out. Yeah, because it would have so. been wonderful to have that up front so that, okay, wow, you know what? I was just diagnosed with fibromyalgia. <gasps> That was on that list back then, you know, right, oh, they exactly. talked about hair loss. Oh, they talked about brain fog and vertigo issues and tinnitus. And, um, exactly. it, I mean, you, we could, we could go on and on and on. Cause there's probably about 50 ish that, that are right. primary, um, things that, that we can symptoms. watch for symptoms that we can watch for. Yep. Um, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to say, oh yeah, you know, even though I didn't think it would happen to me. I'm starting to have these diagnoses. I'm starting to have these symptoms. Oh my goodness. Maybe it could be my breast implant. Exactly. Right. Well, and then for me too, um, personally, I would not have chosen to get breast implants because I'd had cancer three times at that point in my life. I was 44 years old. I don't need more health problems. I've been through a lot. So my first cancer, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma when I was 23. Um, so it's just been, you know, ups and downs and that little cancer cloud hanging over my head for the last 20 plus years. Um, so for some of us, you know, we might not choose that. A lot of these women, especially uh, women in the fitness industry, I mean, they're eating all organic, they're eating clean, they don't drink alcohol, they're bodybuilders, and they have no idea that they're putting these toxic chemicals inside their body. So they just deserve to know. Um, so, so yeah, our, our law will outline those things in a very easy to understand format. Um, you know, we expect the doctors to go over that checklist, but, and the doctors, honestly, this is in their best interest too, because they're covering themselves. Right. Um, so I think it's just a win-win for, for all parties involved. And, you know, we're hoping that if we continue to do this, in different states that we can take it nationally and just, you know, pass a federal law that will just make this common sense. And it really and truly is. Um, but there's so much work to be done with so many other different pieces of the puzzle. Um, a lot of women, as you know, have problems getting uh, explants covered by insurance. Yes. So there's a lot to talk about there. Um, you know, ultimately the manufacturers, should be responsible for their product, their product that they were, you know, telling everyone was safe. And for some women, it's not. So where's the accountability, mm -hmm. right? Um, so of course, insurance companies aren't going to want to pay. It's not their problem. They didn't create this problem. The manufacturers did, but you know, hopefully we'll get a little bit of a domino effect where the insurance companies will start putting pressure on the implant manufacturers and say, Hey, you know, we don't want to pay for a $10,000 surgery. We didn't, you know, encourage women. This was a cosmetic procedure. Um, so it, they made it very clear back when silicone was put back on the market that it was a cosmetic procedure. So there's a lot of chips that need to fall into place, I think, to just get everybody on the same page. Um, one, one thing that I was really disappointed about just last week is we were on the schedule with, um, so CMS and the CDC, which is Medicaid services and the CDC, um, they have a committee that uh, is in charge of forming like the medical codes. <laughs> and when, um, so when there is a medical diagnostic code, they can, you know, run it through insurance and maybe get explant surgeries covered without a code for breast implant illness. Technically, you know, what they're saying is 
it kind of doesn't exist. We don't really know how to categorize it. Um, we were really excited after the FDA meetings last year, you know, we had the two day hearing and it was very productive because, you know, the FDA basically admitted that breast implant illness is real. Um, you know, breast implants cause illness, they cause ALCL. And so once, that happened, things kind of started falling into place. And we were actually on the schedule last September um, to discuss getting an ICD code for breast implant illness. Well, they postponed it and they kind of put it off until this month, March mm. of 2020. And we just found out last week they postponed it yet again mm. because they're waiting on more information. They're waiting on some studies. You know, at the end of the day, the implant manufacturers, the doctors, the surgeons, the researchers, they've had 40 years to get studies, data, information, science. There's plenty of it out there. So um, I think we just really, really need to put the pressure on them to get that information, dig it up, figure it out, and address the issues that are at hand. That's kind of where we're at right now. So there's, there's a lot to be done and there's still a lot of awareness. And I think it's great, um, even what you guys are doing with, with your podcast and just getting awareness out there because for so many years now, everything's been in these closed private groups mm -hmm. and it's all kind of been secretive and hush hush. And, um, it's, it's, it's a very difficult way to try and get things done. Yeah. Um, but if there's people stepping out and coming together at the table to, you know, just address these issues, discuss solutions, collaborate with each other solutions are in the future. Absolutely. And that's what and keeps me going. Yes. And that's exactly you're, you're, you know, you, yes, you hit the nail on the head because that's what we wanted to do. Here I was with all of these mystery symptoms. I could not figure it out. I don't know. It, I want to go to your story here in a minute and find out if you knew immediately that this was an issue or if you had to put the pieces together as well. But here I am on the group. Some of the groups are very like, like, um, the one by Nicole, you know, healingbreastimplantillness.com. And Nicole Deruda has an amazing Facebook group. In fact, if this is impacting your life, I fully, I fully encourage you to get on that group. It's such a beautiful, amazing, you know, synergy of women lifting each other up and answering questions and coming together. But I saw some of my personal friends on there when I finally was led to that page that were discussing it. And I was quite honestly taken back going, wait a second, why isn't anybody talking about this? Because if someone was talking about this, maybe I could have put these pieces together six months ago or a year ago or whenever it started, you know, with my rashes and some of my severe anxiety and some of those things before I started to get this diagnosis of fibromyalgia and, and uh, you know, leaky gut, Hashimoto's, all of these things, maybe I could have figured it out. And that exactly. is when this came to be was, you know, anger is a good thing. I think anger is a great emotion. Anger got- If you get, channel it properly. Yeah. Anger gets things done. <laughs> and we decided I got pissed off quite frankly and went no more. You know what? I don't really care if people don't, um, ex like if, if they are, however perceive me differently because, oh, I'm admitting I have breast implants. I'm admitting that I made this decision. I am going to be this platform. And what's really exciting is the three of us had these platforms already that were already out there to, I feel like it was really divine intervention that we already had the background. Now we can be this voice out there letting people right. know and inviting the men to come into the conversation. You know, on a group, it's Absolutely. not appropriate to have the men. Um, we are right. we're showing before and afters, it's not appropriate to have them in that discussion. But guess what? They can advocate. They can make sure that that sister or aunt or, or um, you know, cousin has the information. They can help us bring it before the people and connect us with those decision makers, right? Exactly. So we want to invite the men. Come on, men, hold our hands. Help us get to yeah. where we need to be. And um, yes. so, so I love that what you're doing and, and how we're starting to say, you know what, we're not going to be quiet about this anymore. We're going to make sure right. that we let individuals know and help them to become educated so they can make an informed decision. You know what, at the end of the day, they may, 
end up getting breast implants and they may end up not getting sick. They might love them and good on them. You know what? Go sister, go. But if you're not, and you end up in a place where you're planning your funeral, like I was last August, then yeah. you want to know, you want to know why exactly. this is happening exactly. to you. Um, and that leads me to you. Tell us how you put this together. You'd had breast cancer. You decided that I'm done. I'm just going to go ahead and have a mastectomy, right? And avoid all of the other yeah. things. Um, I was actually, I consider myself really fortunate. Um, because I did such radical surgery, I escaped having to do chemo. Um, and I didn't, I wasn't able to do any more radiation because I've had too much radiation from my prior cancer. So I was a very unique uh, breast cancer patient because most breast cancer patients will do surgery and they'll do either chemo, radiation, or both, or they'll do the hormone uh, blockers, which is hormone therapy. So I did none of that. Mm -hmm. And I felt great when I had breast cancer. I was walking five to seven miles a day. I was active. I was a busy mom keeping up with two teenage boys who were 16, 18. You know, um, I was running a basketball program at school. I had no health issues whatsoever. Um, I've also had many surgeries in my life. I think my double mastectomy was my 14th surgery. And I do great with surgery. I heal really quickly. Um, you know, my husband had to like put the vacuum in his car after my C-sections because I was just up back at it, you know, four days after just, just, just the family room, just to keep it clean. So, um, I couldn't figure out after my surgery, why I just was not bouncing back. And I had the tissue expanders in first and I only had those in for three months and they were horrific. But then I got the tissue expanders taken out and put smooth silicone breast implants in mentor. And I woke up from that surgery and I knew something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. I could just feel it. I could just tell. And it wasn't me being groggy from anesthesia. I wake up from anesthesia just like this. Like, let's go to lunch. Let's go shopping. Um, it was different. It was like something doesn't feel right. And my symptoms started immediately. Within 48 hours, um, headaches, migraines every single day burning pain, um, pain in my neck and shoulders. And um, I had insomnia. I never had problems sleeping my whole life. I've never had any kind of anxiety or depression, any issues like that my whole life. Um, I, I, I did start to get really anxious. Both my kids were driving at the time. And every time they would leave the house, I was freaking out that they would get in a car accident and irrational, just not, th those thoughts weren't making sense. Um, I was in physical therapy three days a week. The whole time I had my breast implants in, um, I started losing my hair. I, my eyes were always red. At halftime during the basketball games, I'd have to go put Visine in my eyes because I looked like I'd been up for days, which I had. And um, my eyelashes started falling out. I had a rash on my legs. I had a lot, rash on my chest. So I just, I was actually on breast cancer support groups trying to figure out how to fix this and what is everybody else doing? I did go back to my surgeon four times and all she did was throw pills at me and I'm not a pill popper. Like I had my thyroid removed in 2010 and that's the only pill I take, but she was giving me like sleeping pills and pain pills, muscle relaxers, gabapentin. I didn't want to take pills. I wanted to be better. Mm -hmm. I didn't want a band aid. I wanted to fix my problems. And it was another breast cancer lady who said, uh, look into your breast implants. I had an augmentation for 12 years and eight of those years, she was definitely ill. Mm -hmm. And that made sense to me. So I told my husband that night, I said, I think it's my breast implants. And I wasn't even on Facebook at the time. So I had heard about groups and stuff like that. And as soon as I started doing research and found a couple things, I'm like, that's it. I'm having them taken out. I only had them in for four months. Wow. So I had them taken out. Yeah. After four months and within 48 hours, I was legit, like totally fine. Oh my I was human word. again. I, you know, yeah. and this, this brings up ladies, if you have this gut feeling and you're led to the answer, you know, I believe we have this inner intuition for a reason and you Absolutely. honored that. And same with me. I had to, when I shared my story, I discovered the answer. And within 12 days I had my surgery, which doesn't happen. Right. And right. some people went, 
wow, why didn't you do more research? Why didn't you go to more consultations? And I'm you just of, knew. I just knew, <laughs> Robin, I just knew it was like a lightning bolt that came down. And yes. honestly, there are people that are going to listen to this podcast, watch the YouTube version of this that are going to say, I'm start, I'm feeling it. Like, I feel like this is my answer. And my, my encouragement to you is honor that honor that and take yeah. action on it. If that's how you're feeling, don't let the world dictate what you're going to do in the research and the doctors. You'll probably run into a doctor that may not embrace breast implant illness. Um, if you don't, I'm, right. I'm, I'm very happy for you and, and shocked at the same time, because there's a lot of doctors out there that don't embrace that this even exists. So my, right. my recommendation is listen to that inner voice. I, I have absolutely yet. follow your gut. Yes. Follow your gut. So you yeah. had them for four months. That is four remarkable. Months. Well, and the interesting thing about mine too is, you know, I'm on these breast cancer support groups and everyone had the same problems as me, but they were blaming it on chemo mm -hmm. and radiation. And I'm sitting here going, girls, I did not have any of that. Um, so I knew it wasn't from that. And here's what really lit my fire is after I had them removed and I felt so good so quickly, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, Oh my gosh, how many other breast cancer women are suffering with this mm -hmm. thinking it's their chemo and their radiation mm -hmm. and, and they're just okay with that. Um, and I'll tell you the, the breast cancer community um, is pretty resistant to mm -hmm. the whole concept of BII. Um, but we've made great strides in that. Actually, just in December, breastcancer.org came out with a huge special report on breast implant illness and ALCL, which was huge to break through into the breast cancer community like that. Um, you know, because I was on some of those groups and the ladies just didn't want to hear it. And then they were saying that I was fear mongering and I was trying to scare people. And, you know, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not here to tell anybody don't get breast implants. I'm just telling my story. This is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't have chemo but my hair was falling out. I had rashes, you know, I had insomnia. So that's what really just kind of struck me. Like I, I couldn't just sit by and do nothing about it. Yeah. And you know? isn't it remarkable and not a coincidence that you were in a place where you could say, I didn't have chemo. I mean, I can't even blame it on chemo. Right. Like right, here I right. am a, a person who can tell you that I didn't feel like this before. And now I feel like this and I took exactly. them out and I reclaimed my health. So I was exactly. able to, to find the root. And so my next question is this, how do you like where you're at right now? Because one of the things they probably encouraged you I, in fact, I think you mentioned to this before we recorded was that you wouldn't feel feminine. You wouldn't feel like a woman if you didn't have your right. breast tissue, right? What do you yeah. think, Robin? Where are you at with them? That is a really big problem for the breast cancer ladies. Um, I'm a little bit different though. I, I've always kind of been my own drummer um, ever since I was a little girl. So I, I'm just kind of one of those people that, I don't really care what people think about me. So the lady who we're actually like best friends now, she, she's the one who saved my life. Um, she, unfortunately, she had her breast implants for augmentation. And then when she went to go get them removed, she had an MRI to make sure they weren't ruptured and they found a mass mm. and she had breast cancer. So not only was she going in for explant, she ended up having to have a double mastectomy for breast cancer. Mm. So she actually ended up living, she lived 15 minutes from me. So we met for lunch one day and we had talked online and we had texted each other. So I knew she was flat, but I had never met or seen anyone who was flat. And so we met for lunch one day with another breast cancer lady and I got to the restaurant first and then Michelle got there after, right after me. And she walked in, I'm like, she looks awesome. Yeah. She looks fantastic. Yeah. And I was like, I can do that. I can totally do that. And that was it. I mean, that was it. Like, and I, I have not regretted it one day, one second for any reason whatsoever. Um, in fast either. Sorry That's about okay. that. Not a problem. Um, okay. So, so yeah, I, I just, I haven't regretted it. And then um, because I had already met my deductible uh, with insurance, they actually will pay for prosthetics for breast cancer ladies to wear, you know, like you can get a bra and they specially fit the bra and you put the prosthetics in there. And I got them just because 
I had met my deductible. They were free. They're yeah. expensive. It was like $900 for wow. two prosthetics and three bras. I've never worn anything, not once. And it took me actually like three or four months to even pick them up from Nordstrom's because I was just like, oh, I'm not going that way. And I, I just don't care. I don't care. I feel fantastic. I feel like I look fantastic. And um, it, it's very freeing and kind of, you know, I feel pretty badass. Yeah, so I love it. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't about, bother me one bit. Think about <laughs> what a warrior you are. I mean, really, I, yeah. I before I even you know, started recording you. I'm like, she went through cancer and breast implant illness. Look at this warrior of a woman. I had so much respect even before I started call, uh, you know, talking to you and speaking to you. And I feel that very same way for every woman who has gone through this and survived and gotten on the other side and taken back their life and now are living in their highest and best because now they feel good. And right. you're quite honestly, you're right. Some of our greatest gifts happen of our, in our darkest hours. I don't regret what happened to me. I'm a different human being because of it. Obviously I'm Absolutely. showing up in a different way in this world than I ever would have expected. Right? Like I was going right. on a whole different path and here I am advocating and helping spread the message that this really exists and that, you know, talking to experts and people like yourself about their stories and you in this place of making change on a federal level, on a state level. And that begs the yeah. question next. If someone wants to get involved, they're like, okay, I want to do what Robin did in Arizona in my own state. What do I do? Where do I go? How do I even begin? What would you suggest to them? Um, the, the, the most important first step is just having a connection with a state legislator. Um, I was very fortunate that one of my Arizona breast implant illness ladies um, she's a local, she's a native, and she went to high school here with one of our state senators. And um, she said, you know, I think we need to do something about this. And I said, if you can get us a meeting, you know, let's go talk to her. So the three of us met for coffee one day and she's like, yeah, let's set up a meeting with a couple of the other state senators and the health policy advisor. And um, it just kind of got started and snowballed from there. Um, so definitely if you if you know someone or you know someone who knows someone um, that has a connection, that's the first step. Um, I'm actually very happy to package up all of my materials, everything I've worked on, tie a cute little bow around it and pass it along to anyone who's willing to do this in their states. Because at the end of the day, um, I, you know, I definitely think there's a place for the support groups where women are very, very sick and they put those pieces of the puzzle together. They need that support. But when women get better and they're pissed off. They need a place to channel that energy. You know, this happened to you. It's not fair. Don't you want accountability? Don't you want to do something about this? Don't you want to fix this? Mm. And that's where, you know, you take it to the next level. Um, and, and there's quite a few of us now who have stepped up and, you know, stepped out of the box and collaborated with surgeons, with the FDA, with the uh, American Society of Plastic Surgery. We actually were just at their annual conference in September in San Diego. They have never in the 88 years of their existence ever led a patient group in that meeting. Wow. And they let us in. So um, they know there's a problem and, you know, I give them props for addressing it mm -hmm. and, and being open-minded enough to let us in and give us a seat at their table so that we can all just kind of have the discussions and discuss solutions. That's the only way we're going to fix this. We're not going to fix this behind a computer screen and closed private, you know, groups um, where just like you, you're like, I had no idea my friends were going through this. Mm -hmm. So we have to be bold. We have to be bold and we have to step up and we have to take it to the next level. Yeah. And, and that's how we'll fix it. Absolutely. Amen. And I, I love that. So I encourage anybody that's out there that is in that space where Robin and I are, that we're, we're going to make a difference in this. We're going to pay it forward. We're going to help someone else reclaim their health. We're going to help the next generation make an informed and educated decision, right? Because Absolutely. honestly, we don't want to be zealots, right? If we, be, if we take the stance of this zealot action, think along the lines of anti-vaxxers and how, how sometimes something can get so emotionally charged that, you know, that, that it becomes the devil, right? You know, we exactly. want to take the stance of 
implants don't impact every woman out there the way they did Robin and myself. Um, I would venture to guess probably more than we know because people don't understand that it's the breast implants that's causing the problem. However, right. I have two sisters that have um, you know, breast implants and they're not sick. They don't have any right. of these issues, right? And so I'm not going to demonize them because they have them. Exactly. And I certainly wouldn't demonize a woman for choosing to get them, but she needs to understand what could happen up front. And that's what you're doing, Robin. And I so applaud you for everything you're doing and all of the hours and the time and the passion that you're putting into this. Um, thank you so much for being a champion Thank for you. women and making sure that our future generation has this, this opportunity to understand. I, I so applaud you for that. Thank you. I appreciate it. But, okay. So Robin, if someone wanted to reach out to you and get this little package with a little bow on it for them to be able to, to now work in their own States and start making some shifts and changes and legislation where, how would they get in touch with you? Um, I usually check my Facebook messenger pretty much every day. Um, or they can email me my email. So, um, we started breast implant safety Alliance, which is BISA. So my email is BISA, B I S A dot. My name, Robin Tow, R O B Y N T O W T at gmail.com. Wonderful. So, and, um, yeah, you know, just, it's, it's kind of interesting because once, once we took that step to meet with legislators, meet with the Plastic Surgeon Society, um, the Medical Association, you know, it becomes very brief telling our story. That period, like we're kind of past that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And not, not to minimize anybody's story because everyone's story is so different and their journey is so hard in, in their own way. Um, but we're kind of past the point of telling our story and now what would we want to see changed mm -hmm. that that won't happen to the next generation. So um, my, my biggest suggestion is when you're talking to people who, you know, the powers that may be that might have some kind of influences, keep your story brief, just say, Hey, I got sick from my breast implants, but I had no idea that I was supposed to get this. And my doctor should have told me this. Um, and I'd really like to see that changed. So I think if we, if we act very professional and level headed and open minded, those conversations will happen organically. And that's really the way we've, we've gotten a lot of things done is just collaborating with the right people um, and listening to both sides, you know? So I'll admit when, when this first happened to me, I was mad at all plastic surgeons, like this is their fault. How could they do this to patients? You know, but the more I researched, a, a lot of them didn't know some of this stuff. Yeah. They had heard about Dow Corning, but you know, they only know what those manufacturer reps come in and tell them. And, uh, there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of miscommunication between the, uh, you know, the manufacturers and the FDA, the FDA and the general public. I mean, they were hiding over 446,000 reports of women that were sick wow. from breast implants. You know, that's, that's not okay. So now that all this information has come out, what do we do with it? So we have to collect it all. We have to get the research that's been going on over the last few decades and, really look at it closely, put the pieces together. We're involved in some, some really um, neat studies that are going on. So I really see a lot of progress happening. And um, when those women are ready to come join us and fix these problems, we're happy to have them. And we're excited to do so. Oh, that is fantastic. I've been honored yeah. to spend this time with you, Robin. I so appreciate what you're doing again. And those of you that are listening, you had, you, you heard her information, what you could do next. If this was where you're at and you wanted to pay it forward and, and be a change maker in your own community, I am going to also list her email address also in the comments or the description of the podcast and the descri description of the YouTube channel so that you can have that and it's really easy to find. And I'm hoping, Robin, that you get a whole lot of emails from this. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping and that we're going to yeah. have to find other people to help you reply to them. I would love it. I would love to see every state start to pass this type of legislation as a beginning point, right? And then Absolutely. we can tackle the next step and make sure that um, women are remaining healthy and are reclaiming their health if they're in a place where they're sick. So with that being said, Absolutely. 
Thank you, Robin. It's been an honor and I so appreciate you. Thank you for listening. Spread the word by subscribing, liking, and sharing the Killer Boobies podcast today. You could be the person who helps someone reverse their pain and suffering and reclaim their health today.